Recording by Louise J. Bell. Part 3 of Wake Not the Dead. All the horrors of a guilty, upbraiding conscience became his companions, now that he was awakened from the delirium of his unholy pleasures. Frequently did he curse his own obstinate blindness, for having given no heed to the hints and admonitions of his children's nurses, but treating them as vile calumnies. But his sorrow was now too late, for although repentance may gain pardon for the sinner, it cannot alter the immutable decrees of fate. It cannot recall the murdered from the tomb. No sooner did the first break of dawn appear than he set out for his lonely castle in the mountains, determined no longer to abide under the same roof with so terrific a being. Yet vain was his flight, for on waking the following morning he perceived himself in Brunhilde's arms, and quite entangled in her long raven tresses, which seemed to involve him and bind him in the fetters of his fate. The powerful fascination of her breath held him still more captivated, so that, forgetting all that had passed, he returned her caresses, until, awakening as from a dream, he recoiled in unmixed horror from her embrace. During the day he wandered through the solitary wilds of the mountains, as a culprit seeking an asylum from his pursuers, and at night retired to the shelter of a cave, fearing less to couch himself within such a dreary place than to expose himself to the horror of again meeting Brunhilde. But, alas, it was in vain that he endeavored to flee her. Again, when he awoke, he found her, the partner of his miserable bed. Nay, had he sought the center of the earth as his hiding place, had he even embedded himself beneath rocks, or formed his chamber in the recesses of the ocean, still had he found her his constant companion. For, by calling her again into existence, he had rendered himself inseparably hers. So fatal were the links that united them. Struggling with the madness that was beginning to seize him, and brooding incessantly on the ghastly visions that presented themselves to his horror-stricken mind, he lay motionless in the gloomiest recesses of the woods, even from the rise of sun till the shades of eve. But no sooner was the light of day extinguished in the west, and the woods buried in impenetrable darkness, then the apprehension of resigning himself to sleep drove him forth among the mountains. The storm played wildly with the fantastic clouds and with the rattling leaves as they were caught up into the air, as if some dread spirit was sporting with these images of transitoriness and decay. It roared among the summits of the oaks, as if uttering a voice of fury, while its hollow sound, rebounding among the distant hills, seemed as the moans of a departing sinner, or as the faint cry of some wretch expiring under the murderer's hand. The owl, too, uttered its ghastly cry, as if foreboding the wreck of nature. Walter's hair flew disorderly in the wind, like black snakes wreathing around his temples and shoulders, while each sense was awake to catch fresh horror. In the clouds he seemed to behold the forms of the murdered, in the howling wind to hear their laments and groans. In the chilling blast itself he felt the dire kiss of Brunhilde. In the cry of the screeching bird, 
he heard her voice. In the moldering leaves he scented the charnel bed out of which he had awakened her. Murderer of thy own offspring, exclaimed he in a voice making night and the conflict of the elements still more hideous. Paramour of a bloodthirsty vampire, reveler with the corruption of the tomb. While in his despair he rent the wild locks from his head. Just then, the full moon darted from beneath the bursting clouds, and the sight recalled to his remembrance the advice of the sorcerer when he trembled at the first apparition of Brunhilde rising from her sleep of death, namely, to seek him at the season of the full moon, in the mountains, where three roads met. Scarcely had this gleam of hope broke in on his bewildered mind than he flew to the appointed spot. On his arrival, Walter found the old man seated there upon a stone, as calmly as though it had been a bright sunny day, and completely regardless of the uproar around. Art thou come, then? exclaimed he to the breathless wretch, who, flinging himself at his feet, cried in a tone of anguish, Oh, save me, succor me, rescue me from the monster that scattereth death and desolation around her. Wherefore a mysterious warning? Why didst thou not rather disclose to me at once? all the horrors that awaited my sacrilegious profanation of the grave. And wherefore a mysterious warning? Why didst thou not perceivest how wholesome was the advice? Wake not the dead. Wert thou able to listen to another voice than that of thy impetuous passions? Did not thy eager impatience shut my mouth at the very moment I would have cautioned thee? True, true, thy reproof is just. But what does it avail now? I need the promptest aid. Well, replied the old man, there remains even yet a means of rescuing thyself. But it is fraught with horror and demands all thy resolution. Utter it then, utter it, for what can be more appalling, more hideous than the misery I now endure? Know then, continued the sorcerer, that only on the night of the new moon does she sleep the sleep of mortals? And then all the supernatural power which she inherits from the grave totally fails her. Tis then that thou must murder her. How? Murder her? echoed Walter. Aye, returned the old man calmly. Pierce her bosom with a sharpened dagger, which I will furnish thee with. At the same time, renounce her memory forever, swearing never to think of her intentionally, and that, if thou dost involuntarily, thou wilt repeat the curse. Most horrible, yet... What can be more horrible than she herself is? I'll do it. Keep, then, this resolution until the next new moon. What? Must I wait until then? cried Walter. Alas, ere then, either her savage thirst for blood will have forced me into the night of the tomb or horror will have driven me into the night of madness. Nay, replied the sorcerer, 
that I can prevent. And, so saying, he conducted him to a cavern further among the mountains. Abide here twice seven days, said he. So long can I protect thee against her deadly caresses. Here wilt thou find all due provision for thy wants. But take heed that nothing tempt thee to quit this place. Farewell. When the moon renews itself, then do I repair hither again. So saying, the sorcerer drew a magic circle around the cave, and then immediately disappeared. Twice seven days did Walter continue in this solitude, where his companions were his own terrifying thoughts and his bitter repentance. The present was all desolation and dread. The future presented the image of a horrible deed which he must perforce commit, while the past was empoisoned by the memory of his guilt. Did he think on his former happy union with Brunhilde, her horrible image presented itself to his imagination, with her lips defiled with dropping blood. Or did he call to mind the peaceful days he had passed with Svanhilda? He beheld her sorrowful spirit, with the shadows of her murdered children. Such were the horrors that attended him by day. Those of night were still more dreadful, for then he beheld Brunhilde herself, who, wandering round the magic circle which she could not pass, called upon his name till the cavern re-echoed the horrible sound. Walter, my beloved, cried she, Wherefore dost thou avoid me? Art thou not mine, forever mine? Mine here and mine hereafter. And dost thou seek to murder me? Ah, commit not a deed which hurls us both to perdition, thyself as well as me. In this manner did the horrible visitant torment him each night, and, even when she departed, robbed him of all repose. The night of the new moon at length arrived, dark as the deed it was doomed to bring forth. The sorcerer entered the cavern. Come, said he to Walter, let us depart hence, the hour is now arrived. And he forthwith conducted him in silence from the cave to a coal-black steed, the sight of which recalled to Walter's remembrance the fatal night. He then related to the old man Brunhilde's nocturnal visits, and anxiously inquired whether her apprehensions of eternal perdition would be fulfilled or not. Mortal I, exclaimed the sorcerer, may not pierce the dark secrets of another world, or penetrate the deep abyss that separates earth from heaven. Walter hesitated to mount the steed. Be resolute, exclaimed his companion. But this once is it granted to thee to make the trial. And should thou fail now, naught can rescue thee from her power. What can be more horrible than she herself? I am determined. And he leapt upon the horse, the sorcerer mounting also behind him carried with a rapidity equal to that of the storm that sweeps across the plain, they, in brief space, arrived at Walter's castle. 
all the doors flew open at the bidding of his companion, and they speedily reached Brunhilde's chamber and stood beside her couch. Reclining in a tranquil slumber, she reposed in all her native loveliness. Every trace of horror had disappeared from her countenance. She looked so pure, meek, and innocent that all the sweet hours of their endearments rushed to Walter's memory like interceding angels pleading in her behalf. His unnerved hand could not take the dagger which the sorcerer presented to him. The blow must be struck even now, said the latter. Shouldst thou delay but an hour, she will lie at daybreak on thy bosom, sucking the warm life drops from thy heart. Horrible, most horrible, faltered the trembling Walter, and, turning away his face, he thrust the dagger into her bosom, exclaiming, I curse thee for ever, and the cold blood gushed upon his hand. Opening her eyes once more, she cast a look of ghastly horror on her husband, and, in a hollow, dying accent, said, Thou, too, art doomed to perdition. Lay now thy hand upon her corpse, said the sorcerer, and swear the oath. Walter did as commanded, saying, Never will I think of her with love, never recall her to mind intentionally, and should her image recur to my mind involuntarily, so will I exclaim to it, Be thou accursed. Thou hast now done everything, returned the sorcerer. Restore her, therefore, to the earth, from which thou didst so foolishly recall her, and be sure to recollect thy oath, for shouldst thou forget it but once, she would return, and thou wouldst be inevitably lost. Adieu. We see each other no more. Having uttered these words, he quitted the apartment, and Walter also fled from this abode of horror, having first given direction that the corpse should be speedily interred. Again did the terrific Brunhilde repose within her grave, but her image continually haunted Walter's imagination, so that his existence was one continued martyrdom in which he continually struggled to dismiss from his recollection the hideous phantoms of the past. Yet, the stronger his effort to banish them, so much the more frequently and the more vividly did they return. As the night wanderer who is enticed by a fire wisp into quagmire or bog sinks the deeper into his damp grave, the more he struggles to escape. His imagination seemed incapable of admitting any other image than that of Brunhilde. Now he fancied he beheld her expiring, the blood streaming from her beautiful bosom. At others, he saw the lovely bride of his youth, who reproached him with having disturbed the slumbers of the tomb. And to both, he was compelled to utter the dreadful words, I curse thee forever. The terrible imprecation was constantly passing his lips. Yet was he in incessant terror, lest he should forget it, or dream of her without being able to repeat it, and then on awaking find himself in her arms. 
else would he recall her expiring words, and, appalled at their terrific import, imagine that the doom of his perdition was irrecoverably past. Whence should he fly from himself? Or how erase from his brain these images and forms of horror? In the din of combat, in the tumult of war and its incessant pour of victory to defeat, from the cry of anguish to the exultation of victory, in these he hoped to find, at least, the relief of distraction. But here, too, he was disappointed. The giant fang of apprehension now seized him, who had never before known fear. Each drop of blood that sprayed upon him seemed the cold blood that had gushed from Brunhilde's wound. Each dying wretch that fell beside him looked like her, when, expiring, she exclaimed, Thou, too, art doomed to perdition. So that the aspect of death seemed more full of dread to him than aught beside, and this unconquerable terror compelled him to abandon the battlefield. At length, after many a weary and fruitless wandering, he returned to his castle. Here all was deserted and silent, as if the sword or a still more deadly pestilence had laid everything waste. For the few inhabitants that still remained, and even those servants who had once shown themselves the most attached, now fled from him, as though he had been branded with the mark of Cain. With horror he perceived that, by uniting himself as he had done with the dead, he had cut himself off from the living, who refused to hold any intercourse with him. Often, when he stood on the battlements of his castle and looked down upon desolate fields, he compared their present solitude with the lively activity they were wont to exhibit under the strict but benevolent discipline of Svanhilda. He now felt that she alone could reconcile him to life. But durst he hope that one whom he so deeply aggrieved could pardon him and receive him again? Impatience at length got the better of fear. He sought Svanhilda, and with the deepest contrition acknowledged his complicated guilt. Embracing her knees as he beseeched her to pardon him and to return to his desolate castle, in order that it might again become the abode of contentment and peace. The pale form which she beheld at her feet, the shadow of the lately blooming youth, touched Svanhilda. The folly, said she gently, though it has caused me much sorrow, has never excited my resentment or my anger. But say, where are my children? To this dreadful interrogation, the agonized father could for a while frame no reply. At length, he was obliged to confess the dreadful truth. Then we are sundered forever, returned Svanhilda. Nor could all his tears or supplications prevail upon her to revoke the sentence she had given. Stripped of his last earthly hope, bereft of his last consolation, and thereby rendered as poor as mortal can possibly be on this side of the grave, Falter returned homewards. When, as he was riding through the forest in the neighborhood of his castle, absorbed in his gloomy meditations, the sudden sound of a horn roused him from his reverie. 
Shortly after, he saw appear a female figure, clad in black, and mounted on a steed of the same color. Her attire was like that of a huntress, but instead of a falcon, she bore a raven in her hand, and she was attended by a gay troop of cavaliers and dames. The first salutations being passed, he found that she was proceeding the same road as himself. And when she found that Walter's castle was close at hand, she requested that he would lodge her for that night, the evening being far advanced. Most willingly did he comply with this request, since the appearance of the beautiful stranger had struck him greatly. So wonderfully did she resemble Svanhilda, except that her locks were brown and her eye dark and full of fire. With a sumptuous banquet did he entertain his guests, whose mirth and songs enlivened the lately silent halls. Three days did this revelry continue, and so exhilarating did it prove to Walter that he seemed to have forgotten his sorrows and his fears. Nor could he prevail upon himself to dismiss his visitors, dreading lest on their departure the castle would seem a hundred times more desolate than before, and his grief be proportionally increased. At his earnest request, the stranger consented to stay seven, and again another seven days. Without being requested, she took upon herself the superintendence of the household, which she regulated as discreetly and cheerfully as Svanhilda had been wont to do, so that the castle, which had so lately been the abode of melancholy and horror, became the residence of pleasure and festivity, and Walter's grief disappeared altogether in the midst of so much gaiety. Daily did his attachment to the fair unknown increase. He even made her his confidant. And, one evening, as they were walking together apart from any of her train, he related to her his melancholy and frightful history. My dear friend, returned she, as soon as he had finished his tale, it ill beseems a man of thy discretion to afflict thyself on account of all this. Thou hast awakened the dead from the sleep of the grave, and afterwards found, what might have been anticipated, that the dead possess no sympathy with life. What, then? Thou wilt not commit this error a second time. Thou hast, however, murdered the being whom thou hadst thus recalled again to existence. But it was only in appearance, for thou couldst not deprive that of life which properly had none. Thou hast, too, lost a wife and two children, but at thy years such a loss is most easily repaired. There are beauties who will gladly share thy couch and make thee again a father. But thou dreadst the reckoning of hereafter. Go, open the graves and ask the sleepers there whether that hereafter disturbs them. In such manner would she frequently exhort and cheer him so that in a short time his melancholy entirely disappeared. He now ventured to declare to the unknown the passion with which she had inspired him, nor did she refuse him her hand. Within seven days afterwards, the nuptials were celebrated, and the very foundations of the castle seemed to rock from the wild, tumultuous uproar of unrestrained riot. The wine streamed in abundance, the goblets circled incessantly, intemperance reached its utmost bounds, 
while shouts of laughter almost resembling madness burst from the numerous train belonging to the unknown at length walter heated with wine and love conducted his bride into the nuptial chamber but oh horror scarcely had he clasped her in his arms ere she transformed herself into a monstrous serpent which entwining him in its horrid folds crushed him to death flames crackled on every side of the apartment in a few minutes after the whole castle was enveloped in a blaze that consumed it entirely while as the walls fell in with a tremendous crash a voice exclaimed aloud wake not the dead end of part three end of wake not the dead recording by louise j bell sebastopol california